what social media has done is acted as an accelerant on that bullshit so much so that people I think are more palpably aware of it being more frequent and more intense in their lives at the time in which our wisdom institutions and traditions mm -hmm. have largely dissolved. So the wisdom we need to sift and sort through the information economy um, mm -hmm. is diminished precisely as it's being filled by more and more bullshit. Welcome back, everybody. Today is a special podcast because this is one I've hoped for since I started doing this, and it's to share a conversation with the the brilliant and the admirable John Verveke, Professor of Cognitive Science at the University of Toronto, the creator of the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis series, which I'm always recommending to people. So welcome, John. Thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, th thank you, Mohan. I'm also uh, a cognitive psychology at the University of Toronto, just to make sure mm. that, that that department is recognized as well. I'm in both cognitive, yeah. I'm appointed to both cognitive psychology mm. and cognitive science. And, and I don't know about the brilliant and admirable. That's a, that's a pretty high standard to live up to. Well, but, uh, I know a few people that would probably agree with me, I think. But uh, today, I suppose, just to clarify for people, you know, what we're going to be talking about, really, which is the topic of attention, the attention economy, and probably a bit about artificial wisdom and, and yes. this kind of digital um and i noticed actually your conversation with ian mcgillchrist recently john that that was the starting topic as well i mean mm. how, how pertinent do you think this problem is do you mean the problem that we were were uh in, in captured in an uh, attentional economy that is largely not operating with our best interest at heart is is that what you, is that what you're asking me yeah <laughs> yeah ah, then i think the problem is uh is is very significant i mean it's it, it, it's not correct to think that this just emerged with um, uh, social media. Uh, the problem of bullshit in the technical sense of, you know, salience that catches our attention and uncouples us from uh, a quest for understanding or truth. That's been with us, uh, in, uh, you know, <laughs> perennially since time immemorial. Uh, so what social media has done um, is acted as an accelerant uh, on that mm -hmm. bullshit. Um, so much so that people, I think, are more palpably aware of it being more frequent and more intense in their lives. At the mm -hmm. time in which our wisdom institutions and traditions mm -hmm. have largely dissolved, so the wisdom we need to sift and sort through uh, the information economy um, mm -hmm. is diminished precisely as it's being filled by more and more bullshit. So those two things combining together make it very exigent for us. Yeah, the real, that kind of catch 22 almost of the thing that would get us out of it is the thing that's most absent at the moment. And something yes. at the start of that conversation with Ian, he made the distinction with rationality as a uh, ratio as the proper apportioning of attention yeah. and character traits. And I wondered like what then you know, what effect does an attention economy have on rationality? If the, the aim of that attention economy is to change your proportioning of attention, I mean, is it something that's detrimental then to rationality? Is it the... Oh, yeah, Because it's much. kind of distorting it. Mm. Yeah, so so it becomes a vicious cycle. Um, mm. the, the, you know, the bullshit prevalence in the attentional economy reduces the capacity and the time, and therefore the opportunity, uh, to cultivate mm -hmm. the proper attentional proportioning that is conducive to mm -hmm. wisdom. And then that makes us more susceptible uh, to the bullshit, and it, it's a vicious mm -hmm. cycle, which, of course, the monetization of that economy counts on to a very significant yep. degree, that people can get sucked in. And we've all had that experience of, I'll just take a look mm -hmm. at my phone, for a few minutes and we realize, oh my gosh, 35 minutes has passed. Where did that time go? And we have nothing to show for it precisely. Now, just think of that happening repeatedly uh, within your life on multiple timescales for many people, and you get a sense of what we're talking about here. 
Mm, and that, yeah, and that it kind of, I suppose that, yeah, institutionalized distraction where people are more and more, I spoke to Colin DeYoung on the podcast actually about his work oh. and personality on this topic. And I kind of put the question to him of like, if conscientiousness is the ability to um, stave off distraction or to minimize distraction, would technologies of distraction decrease conscientiousness or have an effect on it? And he seemed to think that that was a, a realistic idea. And you, I guess you can kind of see it with the rise of ADHD and other kind of issues that seem to be connected to this technology. But I, maybe not to dwell on the problems for too long, but I'd be more yeah. interested in your ideas of how we, you know, get the hell out of this vicious cycle. You know, what, um, what do you see as some possible opportunities maybe in the chaos well, it's good that you were talking to colin he's a former ta and student mm. of mine and so i'm glad to see him thriving uh so significantly um mm. yeah so i i i am hesitating to answer your question because i i want to sort of reframe mm. it slightly because i think an attempt to yeah. just respond to the impact mm. the negative you know, impact that social media is in general having on people um, it is not quite the right way to frame it. I think we have to mm -hmm. ask, how are we in general moving towards an ecology of practices individually and collectively that increases our ability to reappropriate and therefore by that reappropriation gain the ability to properly proportion our attention and mm -hmm. You know, by becoming more and more capable of detecting and responding to um, our self-deception. My concern would be if we if we sort of, oh, well, this is the solution and we move people out of sort of mm -hmm. deleterious dependency on social media, that doesn't necessarily mean that will translate into their lives improving mm -hmm. because it could be that there are other ways in which... Um, their attention can be mis manipulated and, and misled. And like I said, bullshit pre-exists and will continue to exist even if social media mm. collapses. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I think the broader question is, can we, can we rejuvenate the project and the prospect of cultivating an ecology of practices? And is it possible to find a viable home in the virtual world for set ecologies of practices such that mm -hmm. they thrive and grow? That's the question I would rather ask if you'll allow me. And so, yes, absolutely. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's a good one. So given that question, I think the answer is we can, um, and it takes, um, a, a, a lot of, um, interesting innovation, uh, capitalizing on good experimental improvisation about how can we re repurpose this medium such that ecologies of practices can, uh, can take place and can be homed and thrive. Uh, and, and so that is something that I've been trying to explore uh, in my own work with others, with other community builders and leaders, and, you know, really even experiment with, you know, the YouTube format and, different ways of doing things. The very fact that, I, I guess, uh, I, I don't want to self-label, but many people consider Awakening for the Meaning Crisis to be a, a success of some kind. Uh, I wouldn't be talking to you if it wasn't. Um, and that, and it shows that people are capable of, you know, hanging in for like an hour for 50, 50 times uh, 50 hours of lecture series, developing long, complex ar argumentation, uh, generating communities, uh, study groups, watch parties around it, uh, starting to build online communities. So all of that is a proof of concept. And so yeah. that means it doesn't have to be the case that social media, at least things like YouTube, and I'm not so convinced with things like mm -hmm. Twitter, but things like YouTube do not have to necessarily be rabbit holes for us, sucking us into, um, you know, a, 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 a whirlwind of, of, of bullshit. But it is possible to use this medium and other media 
um, in a way that could be conducive and, and counteractive to foolishness and could be conducive to wisdom. Yeah, there's something that you said at the start there, which is we kind of touched on the other day when we spoke, which is the, the context that social media has arisen in coming from the meaning crisis or being something that's yeah. emerged. There's a lot of interesting James Williams, who wrote a book called Stand Out of Our Light. Um, he was a former Google engineer turned ethicist um, who did a lot of work on this, on the attention economy. And he kind of said that uh, these are almost replacements for cultural commitment devices like replacements for spiritual yeah. wisdom traditions, that there is this void yes. of organizing experience and attention and way of life. And that social media has capitalized on that as creators, yeah. as users, as ranking systems for people's social worth, um, that the, the market was there for this type of thing to occur. And that maybe if we had a society where the ecologies of practice and the wisdom tradition was there, it wouldn't have taken root so much. Um, yeah. That, I, I yeah. totally agree with that thesis. I think that that's well argued mm -hmm. and uh, plausibly well mm -hmm. evidenced. I think it's very much the case mm -hmm. that people are seeking in social media uh, the, the kind of connectedness to themselves, to other people in the world that used to be sustained within religions, for example, uh, by ecologies mm -hmm. and practices held within communities that existed within traditions. Um, the problem is, of course, that it, it's pseudo. Uh, the number of con connections you have is not predictive of how connected in the psychological sense you feel. In fact, well, during the decade in the increase in social media, the number of close or good friends that people have on average has continued to decline. Um, and so loneliness is now becoming a crucial thing, a sense of disconnectedness. And when you're disconnect, and this is something people forget, but COVID made it more readily available. Mm. When you're disconnected from other people, you get fundamentally disconnected from yourself because the best way to look deeply into yourself is through the eyes of another that is holding you in proper regard. So I take it totally correct that mm -hmm. the hunger for meaning, connectedness to yourself, to other people, to the world is what powers people, right? making the, the kind of commitments they make to the virtual world. But by and large, that hunger is not being satisfied, which just intensifies people's returning to the social media. And you get, you get sort of the empty, the empty attentional calories. And what people don't realize is, right, how religious the behavior is, or, or maybe perhaps better, mm -hmm. how pseudo-religious it is. Um, so you think, think of people's relationship to their cell phone. They form an identity with it. Like, so now there's good work, so, you know, some good initial work that if, if people, like, are separated from their cell phone, they, they start to experience something that looks like an identity, a bit of an, like, oh, I'm, I'm you know, who am I now? And, I, and I'm, right? And, 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 and that sort of thing. And, 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 and they treat it like an oracle, like you go to it for information. They don't largely understand how it works. It plugs them into this, hyper object, the internet from which all this information flows. It's very much almost like a, like a, a God. Um, and the, the cell phone mm -hmm. is the Oracle. And if any of you, any of you, and people say, well, that's ridiculous. It's like, well, a good measure of what you consider sacred is how much time you devote to it on a regular and reliable basis. Go on your phone, see how much time per day you're spending on it. Subtract from that time. You can definitively say, was productive work. And you'll find that you're doing a lot of stuff that is otherwise useless, yet somehow compelling to you. And I think it, that would make you very clearly aware of, hey, this is, this is tapping into some kind of need, but it's not really fulfilling it. So I think I, I want to, I, 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 I'm taking his argument and even extending it and saying, mm. it, not only does the meaning crisis drive this, it then feeds back and exacerbates the meaning crisis in powerful ways. Yeah, there's an interesting metaphor coming up for me, which is almost of an addiction in a sense that you go to the substance to try and get this kind of relief, this feeling of non-being, this connection, but then it returns you in even worse shape than you were before. And you have this yeah. kind of feedback yeah. loop mechanism, um, which is going on. But th I suppose that goes to the previous point, which is that even if you took away social media, it doesn't solve the problem that's at the root of it, which is this, you know, lack of a, 
a structure for people's attention, a lack of kind of a wisdom tradition, a way of life, you know, yeah. all these kind of problems. So is there a technological solution is kind of what I'm leaning towards. Well, let, let, let me not? first point to the psychological mm -hmm. difference. You're, you're exactly right about addiction and, and that. And that, that that's Mark Lewis's model for addiction as what he calls reciprocal narrowing. Right, you you mm. get tighter and tighter wound. You your your agency diminishes, and the options in the world diminish in this mutually reinforcing vicious cycle, reciprocal narrowing. But you can, and I have asked Mark directly. Well, but the opposite mm. is is possible: reciprocal opening. Is there reciprocal mm. opening possible? And that and it, that's the great proposal in Plato as to as the core of wisdom is a reliable capacity uh, to reciprocally open to reality. And that also is what we experience when we fall in love with somebody. And so the question becomes, are there technologies that allow us to reciprocally open to each other and to the world in a way that would be experienced as a capacity to fall in love with being again? That's what is needed for the meaning crisis. It's can we afford people those transformative experiences and those existential modes so that they are re reliably reciprocally opening with reality so that they fall in love with being again, such that that love outweighs the failures, the foolishness, the faults, and the frustration of our lives. That's what we're asking. That's what people want. They want, am I, am I in love enough in the right way and deeply enough, with and and with and, and, and in a real manner, such that it's worth it. It's worth it to continue existing. I mean, in one sense, Camus is right. Mm -hmm. The only real philosophical question is whether or not you should commit suicide, because everything else spins around that in a powerful way. Mm -hmm. now, yeah, the, the, the falling in love. Question, I think. The answer to that question, sorry for interrupting you. I realized I hadn't fully answered the question. I wanted to be responsible. Mm -hmm. I think the answer to that is it's not in any technology, but it's in the dynamical system of a technology, ecology of practices and communities, and reconfiguring that that would make it possible for people mm -hmm. to fall in love with being such that life is worth living for them. And that that could have as much as the negative feedback loop has caused so many problems that could have a positive feedback loop or a positive totally. causal network. I know that Mark Lewis talks about, um, to kind of go yes. the other way, but there's something that in that falling in love. Cause I, I love that quote that you, know, the Iris Murdoch, you know, love oh. is the incredibly difficult realization that something other than yourself is real. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I want, so. Can technology bring us, or can information technology bring us closer to reality? Because it seems like social media is designed to take us into the cave. It's designed to bring us into yes. this yes. manipulated world of appearance. So I wonder about the hypothesis, because I know virtual reality, I suppose there's a, a potential, but people seem to be very split on whether or not that that could work or if you know we can do it. I wonder what you think. So for me, that comes down to practical questions about the trainability and the practicability of ecologies of practices. Can mm. we, and so, you know, and, and I'm not claiming that this is anything beyond a case study, but case studies at least establish real possibility. During COVID, I taught an online course on meditation, contemplation, and the cultivation mm. of wisdom. And it was, you know, it was successful. A community grew up. And then that community moved into a Discord server community, which continues to grow. Um, mm -hmm. We run, we're going to run that one this weekend. Chris, uh, Master Pietro, Guy Senstock, and his 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 team, and I run an entire workshop weekend on giving people a, a, a pedagogical program of meditation, contemplation, circling, philosophical fellowship, dialectic into dialogos, and it's all done virtually. It's all done on via Zoom. And it it's people by by objective measures, return rate, attrition rate, by subjective report, people telling us, right, um, th these are successful, very successful. Mm -hmm. And I talk to people who have gone to the workshops and then and it transfers. 
They've gone to the workshops and then they've gone back into their lives and set up a group where they're doing these practices. And so that sounds to me like the answer is yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I went to the Dialogos course. I was in the first one and have now a group where we meet monthly <laughs> to do the same thing. And um, and it has transferred even to the podcasting to normal yeah. conversations that I have with my girlfriend where I'm, again, trying to tap into that type of um, state of being where you're, you know, you're not identifying with the outcome as much. It's this kind of openness. There's a flow to it. Yeah. And the the type of experience there allows you to do it in other places. So I guess that's, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, it's a viable alternative. But then again, we have the whole mess of what's going on for the billions of people that are, I suppose, not doing that and are kind of locked into the right. Web2 model. Right. So I, I was careful mm. to, 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 to state I was providing you with evidence for a real possibility. It, it, it's not yes. high in the sky. It's not illusory. It can happen mm. here are real cases um, that's different from the question of can we negotiate um, the culture and can we negotiate some of the people that hold the reins of power such that we could make this a widespread and growing phenomena that's a more challenging question um, what I can say to that is increasingly and Try not to take this as self-promotional. That's not the point I'm making, okay? But in, I, I, I just happen to be the vector through which the information is passing. Increasingly, more and more people are coming to me from the real world, the business world, the governmental world, and wanting to incorporate my work mm -hmm. and the work of, like, this corner of the Internet uh, into that. I released a video... Um, Oh, no, I'm releasing it later today with Ryan Barton. Watch that video. There's somebody coming. Mm. There's an entrepreneur, you know, who whose work is he goes in, he builds organizations, very successful. And yet he had a transformative experience around the meaning crisis, approached me and said, I want to take what you're doing and like make it work. I want to build this two way bridge between cultivating wisdom and the business community, and that sounds like is oh, that's impossible. But if you think about it carefully, mm -hmm. and you get into real, you know, serious uh, shared reflection and innovation around it, no, it is possible. And I also work with Tim Bishop, uh, Next Level, same thing, right? Tom, uh, yeah. Tom Morgan. Uh, so the number of people, and also people from the British government. There was a, I had a conversation with a British lord recently, and there's some people from the British civil service. I had regular meetings with them. <laughs> so. Is it possible? Yes. Mm -hmm. Does that mean it's going to become probable? I don't know. That's a difficult question. But in principle, it can grow and become a real thing such that we could get enough of a set of conducive conditions so that these small, these right now small communities could grow and merge into a community of communities and create a viable alternative culture to the one in which people mm. are falling into depths of despair. Again, I have not given you evidence or argument that it's probable, but I've given you evidence and argument that it is really possible. Mm. And that's a bottom up way almost through the technologies yes. themselves. Yeah. People yes. gathering yeah. together to change yes. the kind of paradigm. Yes, mm. yes. Um, what do you think of a top-down approach? I mean, there's issues that the, are the big conversation at the moment in America is regulating them as public utilities, like the yeah. telephone or like railways or antitrust laws, anti-monopoly ones. Um, but I think there's an issue there in that information technologies aren't really the same. You know, you could end up in a situation like China where you have the government is essentially in control of algorithmic recommendation and decides what yes. people... Yeah, see yeah, yeah. um so i think there's a, a strange kind of um what what seems like a viable alternative or a viable approach um might not be very democratic or very in keeping with our values in the west right so i was just at an amazing symposium on democracy in the 21st century um and they, they were very interested in my work on relevance realization within the collective intelligence of distributed cognition and things like that. Um, and so it was a great pleasure to be there. 
but I also got to hear some very powerful talks. Um, and I can't remember the name of the person. Um, I know this, his first name is Carol, but I can't remember the, the, the last name. But he and his group and the Institute are proposing um, mm -hmm. ways, one of the best proposals I've heard is called D21, ways in which we could actually change elections. Um, and what happens in D21 is basically people have, like, they have more than one vote. Usually they'll have, like, three or four votes. And, and you can't cast, you can't, you can't pile your votes on one person. You have to distribute. Your, you, so if you have four votes, you have to vote for four different people. And what you can do, mm -hmm. you can show it mathematically. You can also, sh not only in simulation, you can show it in practice. Is mm -hmm. what this does very rapidly is it removes polarize it, it, it so that's our current system first past the post rewards you know populism and polarization um, d21 actually punishes polarization mm -hmm. and punishes you know the populist who works by trying to get 20 percent of the vote and only 20 percent and then count on the rest of the vote being diluted so there's all kinds of things in that sense we yep. could implement yep. that are procedural, top-down, that would improve democracy's capacity for being self-correcting and for actually being able to zero in on the consensus majority as opposed to being captured by populism that is po uh, polarizing and basically strangling the democracy. So I do think yeah. there are – and notice that that – what I just said has nothing to do with any political side or position. This is – if we want democracy, we can make it better, and here's a powerful way of making it better. So I do think there are top-down things we could implement in, mm -hmm. our, in how we make our decisions and select our decision makers that could afford the bottom-up that we've been talking about here. I like to think that you know, uh, we should be pairing D21 and Dialogos together. Um, and if we, were, if we put the two together, we could have a real powerful capacity to transform uh, mm. our sense of participation, our sense of connectedness, and our sense that we are cultivating wisdom and virtue. And that would be powerful. That would really help. So I do think there are top-down strategies, and you can justify yep. them both operationally and morally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they think, I mean, it was kind of reminding me there as well, one of the main things with social media is the banning of targeted ads because obviously it's the attention engagement business model but there's a, a question about in elections you know if you can advertise to millions or billions of people and you can swing 10 percent of the vote or even a couple of percent you know how democratic is the vote if you're unconsciously influencing people by yes you know manipulating yeah. them through um advertisements um and that so, seems so, to be another kind of yeah well i just want to respond to that it. The thing about D21 mm. is uh, because people have multiple votes, uh, uh, they generally feel um, more obligated to learn about multiple positions and multiple perspectives, which tends to water down the ability of any one position to get that kind of rapid capture. So that's another advantage of it. Um, mm. So what I'm saying is we can redesign some of the, you know, the, the 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 dynamics of the grammar of how we're doing this that can ameliorate mm -hmm. some of these challenges. Now, imagine if you did that, yeah, mm. top da mm -hmm. top down, and then bottom up, you were encouraging people to be more more, more multi perspectival, more uh, concerned about self deception. Imagine do doing those together in a coordinated fashion. The capacity for people to be so easily manipulated by you know the bullshit of adver political advertising would be significantly reduced it wouldn't be eradicated because you can't eradicate it but I, I i predict it would be significantly reduced the idea of changing the architecture of the sites or the design itself to afford less of the kind of bullshitting and less of this kind of um aggressive advertising model but i mean and just in terms of the artificial intelligence idea that this the yeah. AI is recommending things to you yeah. based on this yeah. model that it's built of your personality and your decision making and it knows all these things about you that you might not even know about yourself and it's quite um, sophisticated. Yeah. Um, could that same thing be used to 
I suppose to make a person more sophisticated at um, their yeah. attentional so apportioning. Yeah. Excellent, excellent question. And then we, we're mm. moving on to this sort of, uh, uh, you know, morally thin ice in some very powerful <laughs> way, right? It's, it's, it goes back yeah. to, you know, Plato's noble lie in the Republic. Uh, mm. Is it right to manipulate people so they are more likely to be tempted by the good? Um, mm. And then what, what, what that comes down to for me is what are the, what's the differences? Because these three things overlap. And we'd have to pull them apart very carefully. What's the difference between manipulation, deception, persuasion, and education, right? <laughs> um, and, and how do we how do we pull them apart? Because presumably, what we want to say is we want morally justifiable education and persuasion to be the only things that are allowed to alter people's uh, behavior. Um, yeah. And then it be, and that means we got to get we have to get very, very clear on what we mean by education. I recommend the work of Zach Stein, uh, Education and Time Between Two Worlds, and uh, some of the videos and some of the stuff, uh, excellent on uh, excellent reflection, some of the best. I mean, his, what, his fundamental thesis, well, one of his fundamental theses is, let's reorient education back to the intergenerational project of cultural ratcheting and off of feeding the market with what it most needs. Um, mm. and, and, the, and the idea is the, the second is a short-term game for long-term pain. Because uh, when we lose intergenerational transfer as the primary goal of education, we are undermining our primary adaptive advantage. Unlike other organisms, we, particip we generate and participate in cultural ratcheting. You and I don't have to learn from scratch, right? But... So we we got to really, really get clear about reorienting education and persuasion. That's part of what I've been doing all this work about expanding and re-enriching and reinvigorating our notion of rationality and reason, binding it to right to spirituality, etc. Because that will make people invested in again, wanting to participate in rational persuasion. Hopefully, mm. that would help distinguish education and persuasion from deception and manipulation so that we could clearly instruct the AI so it was persuading us and educating us rather than manipulating and deceiving us. Yeah, mm. that seems to be the line, isn't it? I was speaking with Massimo Pigliucci recently. Um, oh, I did a podcast yes. with him. Um, Massimo was talking about you can't become more virtuous through nudging because it's not intentional. It's just kind of being, you know, you're just being pushed towards it, um, which is kind of what's happening now. It's a big behavioral yes. modification machine. Yeah, yeah. Um, nudging is, it, yep. Yeah. He's right. Um, so one of the defining differences between education and perception, uh, education and persuasion on one hand and deception and manipulation mm -hmm. on the other is exactly this issue about whether or not your agency, your appreciation in both senses of the word and your apprehension of your agency and your ability to, to enact it is being enhanced or diminished, right? And we, we tend to think of education and persuasion as enhancing our agency and deception and manipulation, like nudging, which is a kind of bullshit, by the way, uh, as mm -hmm. reducing our agency. Now, the primary thing we're supposed to be committed to as a culture, especially a democratic culture, is affording people the enhancement of their agency. That's what freedom is supposed to mean. Um, and so it means we have to decide what we value more. Do we value more a democratic culture or do we value more a, I don't know what to call it, a, 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 con a, a consumer culture in which access to more and more stuff is how we try to measure our life satisfaction. I put it to you this way. I don't think it's reasonable mm -hmm. to conclude we're going to save ourselves from the, the meta crisis, all the X risk factors, and maintain our standard of living. That seems implausible, especially if we want if we start talking about the average standard of living for the world as a whole. Mm -hmm. People will let mm -hmm. you reduce their standard of living if you give them reliable, rational hope 
that you will increase the meaning in their life. And that's, I think, the only trade that has any chance of working. But it comes down to what we're talking about right now. We have to decide. Do we want a certain kind of standard of life? Or do we want a, degree, a certain standard of meaning? Because mm. they are not, they, they're in a trade-off relationship. And so could we bring it about that we could reorient to these emerging technologies and decide for a meaningful culture or, as opposed to a consumer culture? That's, mm. I think that's the difficulty we're facing right now. And there seems to be a shift in values there. It was kind of reminding me of um, stoicism and the kind yes. of the philosophy of that, of a, you know, a philosophy for an ordinary life, um, that it's kind of a philosophy where you don't need tons of things and tons of, you know, excess yachts or whatever else or loads of money. Yes. Um, and the, that, but social media values don't really, the market doesn't really encourage that. So again, That's maybe right. it comes down to this, this wisdom void, but there are people interested in, it. I mean, they don't, um, I think there is kind of a, a hunger there, but do you think that that it's the shift in the values that need to be taking place and that that's the bottom up kind of thing that we should all be involved in? I mean, we, we used to have, we used to have countervailing forces to the mar market. Uh, we mm. used to have, we, we had three things. We had the market, um, we had, um, the state and, and then we had the religion, um, and I'm not advocating returning to anything in a nostalgic fashion. I, I keep saying, you can put on my tombstone, neither nostalgia nor utopia, right? Yeah. Um, but as religion receded, which is part of the cause of the meaning crisis, and as the state was less and less, became less and less influenced by mythology in the positive sense of the word, mythos other than economic, growth so the 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 religion disappeared uh, the state has basically dissolved into uh, the the market and the problem with that is that means that the market no longer belongs to a system by which it can sell, by which it can be brought into correction uh, the market can only internally self correct and there's all kinds of good evidence that uh, you know that that isn't good for some of the problems we're trying to solve. The market tends to reinforce certain patterns, like, and that's your, yeah, that's your point, I think. And so, mm. again, I'm not here as an anti-capitalist, um, and I, 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 I recommend to people they watch the discussion I have with, uh, with, with Ryan that's gonna come out um, uh, on, on Wednesday today, the 28th of September, because we have to ask ourselves if the economy is going to be equivalent to what we mean by culture, because the problem with the economy is it doesn't have a telos other than its own growth. Where is it? Like, what's it? Mm. I mean... And this is actually, and, and, and you can see this spreading. Uh, so at the conference, one of the one of the issues around democracy is that, well, what's the telos of democracy? Like, what, what, what's it for? What, like, yes, we are free from tyranny, but what are we free to do? Uh, the older model was, yeah. it was supposed to free mm -hmm. us to create lives of meaning and virtue and wisdom. Same thing with the market. Okay, the market's growing. To what end? For what? Well, you know, pe pe we are getting more people out of poverty. So the market is really good at that. We like the market; it continues to be a fantastic success at lifting people out of poverty. That is not the same, and that is absolutely. If people are in poverty, forget to, talking to them about meaning, and it, that that's like. But once people are lifted out of poverty, survival. Yeah, and and they, and, they, and they have a stable survival, what is the market doing for them, right? What do I mean by that? Mm. Let, me, let, me, let me be more precise. Once people are out of poverty, so initially generating wealth 
lifts people out of poverty, that is, has a huge impact on their subjective well-being. If you ask them, do you like your life? They'll say, yeah, I like my life. Right? But once they're out of that, it takes huge differences in wealth to make small differences in subjective well-being. This is reliably uh, the work of Ryan and D Dicey and others. So once, you're out of, once you are out of poverty, trying to improve subjective well-being by improving wealth is actually a foolish thing to do. It's irrational. You're not, the probabilities are, are running against you. And then next point, subjective well-being, how sort of good you feel about your life and meaning in life are not identical. They can be separate from each other. They can vary independently. Look, when people have a child, their subjective well-being crashes. Their health goes down. Their sleep goes down. They're not eating properly. They're constantly under stress. Their relationship with their significant under, other is being put under tremendous pressure. By many measures of subjective well-being, it goes down. Why do they have the child? Because meaning in life goes up. That's why they do it. So notice, the market is good at generating wealth and lifting people out of poverty. Absolutely essential. But past a certain point, it doesn't do much for increasing subjective well-being, and it does virtually nothing for meaning in life. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. We don't, we, we're no longer asking because we no longer have things independent from the market. What's the market for? What's its telos? Once we, you know, well, we, we should keep doing it to get more people out of poverty. Yes. Again, I'm not anti-capitalist, but we're not asking the question. Yeah, but what's it, what's the telos of this? Where's it going? Where's it going for people who are reliably out of poverty? Like, what's it doing for them? That's the issue I'm bringing up. Mm, yeah, and that you create a class of people that are essentially in a leisure kind of, um, almost like people of leisure or something, which is something I think with my generation, with millennials and younger people that, you know, had a certain guarantee of um, safety and your things were going to be okay. But then you get these existential crises, lack yeah, of meaning. Yeah like yes. more people committing suicide and you're thinking yeah. we're relatively safer than ever, but everybody's more stressed, more worried because yes. exactly. Um, exactly. it creates other problems. Mm. That's exactly right. And, and, yeah. and this is inevitable. This is, you know, this, this is part of the no free lunch theorem that no problem solving method mm. is universally good. Uh, this is the, this is the, the classic version of the frame problem. There's always side effects uh, beyond the, uh, beyond the intended effects. And, 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 and so we are at a place we, where we should be very carefully and democratically and dialogically considering how we may want to reorient things. I, I know, because I live it, I live in a one-bedroom apartment with my son, right? And I'm not hoarding money away <laughs> or anything like that. It's just that I... I have good reason to believe that I would be able to sacrifice a so-called standard of living as long as I'm reliably secure from poverty and I have you know, access to health care, etc. If it meant that resources were reconfigured and repurposed for addressing the meaning crisis. If some politician was to come and say, here's the plan, mm -hmm. if everybody did this, and I guarantee, and we'll put watchdogs, and these resources and this money will go towards uh, helping people address the meaning crisis, maybe setting something up like uh, the Bill Dunk movement that happened in the Scandinavian countries, secular monasteries, were, et cetera, et cetera. Because mm -hmm. governments have done this in the past and made radical transformations. Look at the work of the Nordic Secret by Lenny Anderson, or her book, Bill Duncan, it, 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 it has happened. And I've talked to some of these people on my channel. So again, it, it, it's not pie in the sky idealism. The Scandinavian mm -hmm. countries went from poor agrarian authoritarian regimes into the kind of countries they are today because they did this movement of redirecting resources to basically setting up a network of secular monasteries for people to go and do the Socratic project of self-knowledge, self-exploration, philosophical education, also relevant skill building, etc. 
it, it has been done. It is not a mm -hmm. fantastic proposal. So if some pol I mean, I wish some, some potential politician was listening to this. Here's a goal. Uh, if, you could, if you could do this, if you could come and say, look, we'll all do this, including the super wealthy. We'll all take this, right? Not, right? And that money will be reliably put into bringing back those persuasive and pedagogical practices and customs and institutions that would help alleviate the meeting crisis. That sounds like a, 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 a terrific proposal uh, for a politician. And if they were to join that with proposing and sticking to their promise of electoral reform, I voted for a prime minister in Canada who, because he promised significant electoral reform and then once he was in office, he reneged on his promise. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is reprehensible. Um, and, because we yeah. need, mm -hmm. we need that kind of electoral reform. But if somebody came in and said, here's my proposal for electoral reform, and here's my proposal for making this transformation, that's possible. It's a real possibility. Mm. And yeah, it seems, I'm almost skeptical of political and economic solutions to the meaning crisis, I suppose, just because it seems so far from the minds of people that are in those kind of positions oh, a lot I of agree. the time. You don't hear it like really talked about or even acknowledged, but there's yeah. something I want to jump on, which is that you mentioned this, this Socratic practice and, you know, yeah. artificial wisdom again was ringing in my head of this idea of a Socratic AI that you could yeah. create, you know, that like that there's actually that the technology is definitely getting to the point where it would be possible to generate some sort of technological solution that could help people cultivate wisdom. It'd be like an opposite of Google. Like you'd go to it with an answer and it would ask you a question instead of the other way around. Right. So it has, um, I, I wonder what you think about that project um, because it's, it's really interesting to me. Okay. So I, I, the, there's lots to say about that proposal. The first thing, mm -hmm. and I gave a talk at the Center for Ethics at AI um, here at the University of Toronto on, on exactly this. We're actually very far from artificial wisdom. Uh, okay. Intelligence is only weakly predictive of rationality and, uh, and, and is therefore even less predictive of wisdom, which is a kind of mm -hmm. rationally self-transcending rationality. Um, and so all we're doing is building AI right now. Very little work on artificial rationality. Um, and... Mm -hmm. It's very likely we're going to be we're going to build very intelligent but very foolish machines, which is bad for them and bad for us. Um, so first of all, we have to switch the ra we have to switch the tracks. We've got to get people more and more talking about artificial rationality, artificial wisdom. That means we have to provide more and more templates. We can use ourselves as templates for intelligence, but we need a lot more people that are clearly rational and mm -hmm. in the sense I talk about and clearly wise as templates for these machines. And so I put it to you that you couldn't put Socratic practice into an algorithm. I have a philosophical argument around that, which is, you know, that it, it, Socrates doesn't even really have a method. Calling it the Socratic method is um, inappropriate. Mm. Socrates has a way of life and a way of, 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 of dialoguing with people. But I think for the to create an artificial sage that could actually function technologically to help us, it would genuinely need to have the insight abilities, the in, in the implicit learning, intuitive abilities, the improvisational abilities of somebody like Socrates. This is why AI therapy is still quite a ways away, um, because therapy isn't just you can't create a script of questions and be a good therapist. Yeah, um, computational. That's right. So mm. I would, I would, I would worry, and I know you're not guilty of any <laughs> malintent. I worry about the opposite. I worry about the opposite mm. of creating pseudo sages, silicon pseudo sages, <laughs> right? That are just spewing out uh, pseudo bullshit, pseudo profound mm. bullshit to people, and people making money off of that. Now, do I? That is doable right now. Where yes, the real we can do thing, that. Probably yes, already doing it. <laughs> yes. So that's why I I want to take your proposal and mm. 
request or recommend to people that they really cultivate the discernment between mm-hmm. wisdom and pseudo profound bullshit so that we put pressure on the people who are going to very shortly build these machines so that we would only be satisfied with something that is up to the Socratic ideal. Now, if we ever made machines that by all of our interactional and more objective measures are as good as Socrates, then we should make them. There's no moral argument to say, in fact, I think there's, we have a moral obligation to create them and to use them to as much as possible lift us up. I think that's, that is quite a ways away. And so I propose this dialectic into dialogos in which we can make use of the collective intelligence of distributed cognition so the group can be the Socrates for each of the members that are participating in the practice. That is doable right now. And if we, get, if we do more of it and develop it and build up right, uh, a more sophisticated ecology of practices and a community of tradition, then that would also act as a good template for people who genuinely want to create artificial mm-hmm. sages. It's such a brilliant idea and it's something that I've never heard anybody else talk about because the talk of AI obviously is everywhere and it's almost like foreshadowed that this is going to be the big thing. But the talk of artificial wisdom is massively under discussed. Yes. Um, yes. So I'm, I'm really glad that you did that. I, I learned about it from yourself, John. And I wonder what would be what would be the Turing test for an artificial wisdom is there such a thing does it exist yet or what would be the the Uh, turing test for a sage is there one uh, yeah i would think it would be that we'd get people who have committed themselves in good faith in good time and with good talent to a socratic way of life like some of the people from the stoic community Mm -hmm. and to interact with this Mm -hmm. and see if they feel as if they were interacting with Socrates or Siddhartha or Spinoza. And then that would be the test. And that is the only one that I think is ultimately morally justifiable. And that one is a long way off. Not impossible, but it's not nearby. It's a great, interesting idea, though, of building those ecologies of practice, building the communities to build the wise people, to build the artificial wisdom. That's something yes. that you could... Uh, that's a project that it is, um, and and yeah. and you could get into uh, you know bootstrapping. I talked about this a while ago in a TEDx talk on neural mm-hmm. enlightenment. We could we the community could get be a better template for the our, the AI, which then could feed back and improve the community to become a better template for improving the AI, and they could reciprocally afford each other's self transcendence. Mm-hmm. Whoa. Well. I think that's about all we have time for, John, unfortunately, but that's quite a note to end it on. Um, thank you so much. And what's what's next for you? What can people look forward to? I know after Socrates is possibly yep, coming Yeah, we filmed soon. 17 episodes of the 23 or 25 that we're planning on doing. Uh, we sh- we're hoping to finish it up uh, early October, like the filming, and get it out late October, early November. So that's what to look for. And it is so germane to everything we, you and I have been talking about. Mm. That's what that, that's what, and it's different. It's not just a lecture series. There's a le- there's every episode is a lecture points to, for ponder, to ponder and to reflect yeah. and to discuss. And then I teach mm. a practice and, and I build, help yes. you build up an ecology of practices going with the lecture. That's so interesting. I, I read Massimo's new book uh, ahead of time to help it to um, interview him. And he's done exactly the same thing, which is bringing the Socratic ideas, but giving exercises, bibliographies. Yep. It seems to be something in the air, maybe, that these spiritual practices and practices and the theory coming together. Totally. Very much so. I agree. It's very exciting. Fantastic. I'll look forward to that, John. And thanks again. Thanks, Mohani. It's been great.